tick tagged on, on this, and we're, we're going to come at the, the topic from two very, um, or we're going to look at two very different aspects of the topic. And um, the case that I'm, or the, the, the angle that I'm going to look at is, is the impact of what I call the prophetic religious tradition on the case for socioeconomic rights. I suppose, you know, the, there are a range of arguments that could be used to justify um, the enforcement of socioeconomic rights, including indeed economic arguments. One could argue that um, protecting socioeconomic rights will enable the beneficiaries of those rights to be um, uh, participants in the economy. Um, but in my opinion, I think the, 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 the impulse behind the demand for enforcement of socioeconomic rights is, is the view that really it is morally wrong for people to have to endure poverty and social inequality. And whereas socioeconomic rights are a relatively recent uh, phenomenon, really a phenomenon of the, of the 20th century, the latter half of the 20th century, that impulse or the, the driving force behind the idea is of much more ancient uh, heritage or, or lineage. And in fact, you can go back to the 8th century before the Common Era, um, to the writings of the prophet Amos in the Old Testament, who was very critical of those, as he put it, who trampled the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and pushed the afflicted out of the way. And this is a very early example of what I call this prophetic religious tradition in which religious leaders or religious teachers act as a conscience of their people, calling them to observe exacting moral standards. Now it's argued by some indeed that this tradition, this prophetic religious tradition, provides the philosophical foundation for contemporary human rights. I mean, the conventional view is that civil and political rights were really the product of the Enlightenment. But somebody like David Bentley Hart, who's written a book entitled Atheist Delusions, the Christian Revolution and its Fashion of Enemies, he argues that in fact the, the bedrock for contemporary human rights goes back to um, Christianity and the, 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 the impact that Christianity had on the Roman Empire. Um, and he argues that Christianity emphasized the immense dignity of each individual uh, and also elevated active charity above all other values. Now, this sort of insight um, you know, works its way through the history of each particular age and, and the conditions of each particular society. And oftentimes, um, it takes some time before the implications of this sort of viewpoint um, are, are fully realized even by, by those who subscribe to um, the, the, the religious beliefs in question. So, for example, if you look at the issue of slavery, um, there's a famous passage in Corinthians where St. Paul refers to the fact that all are equal, uh, men and women, Jews and Gentiles, slave and free. But he doesn't uh, argue from that that the institution of slavery is somehow wrong or somehow contrary to the Christian belief because he just doesn't get that. It's, it's, it's generations later, indeed centuries later, that the working through of that idea of the, the essential dignity of each individual uh, leads to the view that slavery is an abomination and that it needs to be abolished. And so, for example, in the, in the 16th century, you had a, a Dominican friar, Bartholomew de la Casas, arguing for the abolition of slavery in South America. Um, and he, you know, engaged in the debate. The debate at the time was that the indigenous South Americans were somehow less than human and that they needed um, European masters in order to be brought to some status of, of civilization. Uh, but he contested that view and he argued that, um, you know, the, the, the rights of humans were, were universal. And in that way, he's been regarded as one of the first advocates of what we now take for granted, i.e. the notion of universal human rights. Um, in, in the context of, of the British Empire, there's another um, religious uh, person, William Wilberforce, a man who had undergone a spiritual conversion in his 20s and who had become a, an evangelical Christian. It was he who led the campaign, the political campaign against um, slavery, which was ultimately successful. If any of you want to see 
uh, sort of the cinematic uh, depiction of this campaign. There's that movie, uh, Amazing Grace, in which um, Wilberforce is played by Yolan Gruffydd, the Welsh um, actor. Um, you know, give you a good insight into, into uh, you know, the, the dynamics of that particular um, uh, issue. Christianity has also had a very significant influence on the development of socialism in these islands. Uh, the Christian socialist tradition in the United Kingdom goes back to the mid-1800s, 1848, um, and the activities of a number of Protestant clergymen and lay people headed by John Malcolm Ludlow, who were responding to the changing nature of British society as British society moved from a predominantly agrarian society to a heavily industrialised society. The first leader of the British Labour Party, Cara Hardy, was a non-conformist Christian who wrote, the impetus which drove me first of all into the labour movement and the inspiration which carried me on in it has been derived more from the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth than all other sources combined. Now, the Roman Catholic tradition arguably came late to an appreciation of the importance of protecting human rights. But beginning in the 19th century, Catholic social teaching begins to advocate a position, a social position that's midway between capitalism and socialism. So on the one hand, the church defends the right to private property, but on the other hand, it equally defends the rights of workers in the capitalist system, defending the rights of workers to form trade unions and, and the right of workers to be paid a, a decent wage. Through the 20th century, this development of this particular social policy eventually led to the emergence of what's referred to as the preferential option for the poor, which commits the church to a position of solidarity with the excluded and the marginalized. And this position is not peculiar to Roman Catholicism. The, the World Council of Churches has affirmed, and I quote, God's preferential option for the poor and the Christian duty to embrace God's action in the struggles of the poor in the liberation of us all. While writing from the Jewish tradition, Daniel Cohn Sherbrooke sees the commitment to promote social justice as an area of common good between Judaism and Christianity. So down through the centuries, this prophetic religious tradition has provided a resource for tackling injustice and social exclusion in different contexts. In the 20th century, and now we're coming closer to the, tonight's discussion of socioeconomic rights, in the 20th century, Socioeconomic rights have emerged as one way in which to tackle social exclusion. This you know, is a phenomenon that would have been unimaginable in pre earlier centuries where the protection of such rights were not seen as a function of the state. But the um, protection of socioeconomic rights um, runs into some difficulty in the liberal democratic tradition that informs the, the legal system this jurisdiction uh, and in other uh, Western jurisdictions, because in the liberal democratic tradition, rights are generally seen as negative immunities, protection of the individual against a potentially oppressive state. Socioeconomic rights, on the other hand, are generally seen as positive empowerments of the citizen. Um, imposing duties on the state actively to assist the citizen in relation to such issues as basic income, uh, education, uh, health, um, uh, and accommodation. Okay, so there's, you know, broadly speaking, we can say that there, there are different ways of seeing rights. And as I say, the liberal tradition is comfortable protecting the concept of rights as a negative protection, but not so comfortable um, uh, enforcing rights which are seen as positive empowerments. Incidentally, it's interesting to note, I mean, I'm sure some of you, the, the law students among you might be familiar with the fact that the Irish courts have uh, encountered great difficulty in getting their heads around the notion of enforcing socioeconomic rights, and the, the Supreme Court in two cases, TD and the Senate, have, have sent a very strong signal that the courts shouldn't really get involved in the, in the recognition of implied socioeconomic rights because of the implications that this has for public expenditure. But it's really interesting to see the influence even on the Irish Supreme Court of the liberal democratic tradition. Because while in, in the cases of TD and Senate, which concern what we call standard socioeconomic rights, a right to um, education in the case of Senate, 
and the right to be provided with secure accommodation in the case of TB. While in relation to both of those rights, the Supreme Court took a hands-off approach and said, sorry, we can't get involved in this because it involves public expenditure and it's contrary to the doctrine of separation of powers. In another area of the law, uh, criminal legal aid, the Supreme Court on two occasions had no difficulty in extending the criminal legal aid scheme. In the case of the state, Healy and Dunhu in 1976, the Supreme Court essentially constitutionalized the then statutory scheme of civil legal aid, uh, criminal legal aid. Did I say civil legal aid? I meant criminal legal aid, I'm talking about criminal legal aid. And that decision, incidentally, resulted in a five-fold increase in public expenditure on criminal legal aid. Uh, more recently, in a case called Carmody versus the Minister for Justice, the Supreme Court held that the statutory scheme of criminal legal aid uh, was deficient insofar as it deprived Mr. Carmody of the right to be represented by a barrister, by counsel, in the district court. Uh, again, extending the scope of the scheme with presumably um, consequences for, for the cost of the scheme. And yet, in both of these cases, we find no reference to the sort of concerns that, that drove the Supreme Court decisions in TV and Senate. There are no references to the doctrine of separation of powers in, in the criminal legal aid cases. There are no references to concerns about the courts getting involved in distribution of justice which are, are very much to the fore in TV and Senate. And the explanation for that inconsistency, in my opinion, is the fact that in relation to criminal legal aid, the courts were dealing with a traditional central liberal democratic right, namely the right to liberty. Uh, and they're so imbued in that, by that tradition that they didn't see the inconsistency in their position vis-a-vis um, -vis what the, the, the stance they took in relation to TD and Senate. So there is this difficulty then, that the, the Irish legal system certainly has difficulty in taking on board the notion of, of rights as positive empowerments. But in the prophetic religious tradition to which I have referred, uh, rights are seen as, as positive empowerments. This is what David Hollenbach has to say about the understanding of the nature of rights within the Roman Catholic tradition. He says, basic to the Roman Catholic understanding of rights is the premise granted to the idea of rights as power, positive empowerments over rights as negative immunities. In classical liberalism, rights are identified in certain freedoms that are protected against coercion or interference by others. They are defenses against the intrusion that other persons or the government might try to make into the individual zone of freedom. That's the, the classical liberal position. Hollenbach continues, the argument for a communitarian understanding of rights questions whether this liberal view of political rights does justice to their true importance and meaning. And he goes on to argue that um, if you see rights as positive empowerments for life and community, then you will take the view that economic rights are indispensable conditions for any sort of life in common with other human beings. He says, respect for these rights, that's to say economic rights, means that individuals and society as a whole have obligations to take the positive steps necessary to assure that all persons obtain the nutrition, housing, and employment necessary if they are to live minimally decent and active lives. Uh, these economic rights call for enabling persons to express their agency through positive participation in the life of society. Respect for human agency demands that people not only be maintained alive, but alive as active agents of their own well-being through participation in social life, for example, through being able to get a job with adequate pay and decent working conditions. This perspective, this view of rights, effortlessly accommodates uh, the, the, the idea of socioeconomic rights that we're here uh, to discuss tonight. Now, and I'm coming to my conclusion, in presenting this defense of socioeconomic rights based on a prophetic religious tradition, I am, of course, mindful of the fact that institutional religion is, for very understandable reasons, uh, held in no regard by many people today, uh, given the, the, particularly in relation to the Catholic Church, given the, the, the scandals that have beset the Church. And um, I don't propose to go into a discussion as to why that is, except perhaps just to say that I think a lot of the problem is encapsulated in the dictum of Lord Acton, um, with which I'm sure many people are familiar. This is the, the comment 
that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, and it's interesting to note that uh, when he made those remarks, Lord Acton, who was himself a, a Catholic, was referring to the debate within the Catholic Church at the latter quarter of the 19th century about papal infallibility. So he was actually referring to the church when he made that comment, and I think, uh, sadly, recent events bears out the accuracy of his um, maxim. But in reacting to the scandals that have beset the Catholic Church in Ireland and elsewhere, there is, I think, a danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And the prophetic religious tradition of which Christianity at its best is a part offers, in my opinion, a sound philosophical foundation for the defense of all policies promoting social inclusion, including the state protection of socioeconomic rights. Let me, me finish um, with a reference to what I consider to be one of the greatest political speeches ever delivered. Uh, and I'm referring here to the speech delivered by Martin Luther King at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington uh, on the 28th of August, 1963, sometimes referred to as the I Have a Dream speech. Um, this was uh, a speech delivered at the culmination of a mass gathering of some 300,000 people uh, campaigning uh, for civil rights for, for blacks in the United States of America. And if you ever get the chance to listen to the speech, and I think you can download it, you know, it is a remarkably powerful um, uh, speech. Um, Martin Luther King was a Baptist uh, pastor, and his, you know, his, his professional skills as a preacher comes through in the, in the way in which he delivers the speech. And I suppose the most famous part of the speech is where he reiterates this motif of having a dream. Um, this, let me read into the record. I, I, I love the speech. And any chance I guess you to, to read it, I'm going to grab it for hands. It says, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its greed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And his speech culminates in another famous passage, which I'm going to read into the record because I really enjoy it. He says, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Powerful passages, but actually the passage I wanted to cite, additionally, <laughs> is this final one, where he poses the question that is put to the civil rights movement by their opponents, when will you be satisfied? And his answer is as follows. We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the city. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs state, stating for whites only. We can never be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That last phrase, justice rolling down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream, comes from the writings of the prophet Amos, with whom I started this presentation, that 8th century um, BC Old Testament prophet. And I think that ties my presentation together. Let me conclude by saying that whether it relates to the abolition of slavery, the securing of civil rights, 
or the promotion of social inclusion. The prophetic religious tradition offers society a resource that should be cherished. Thank you very much. justifications for socioeconomic rights. Um, and I'm aware that to some extent when we're talking to Flack and Labour about them we're kind of preaching to the choir, but that's sort of enjoyable anyway. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about is the democratic justifications for socioeconomic rights. Um, and it's funny, when I sat down to think about this, what flooded into my mind were actually the objections to socioeconomic rights. And I think that's because so much of the debate about them focuses on why people don't like them and why people object to them. Um, and exploring why that is, I suppose it's, it's because if you accept the idea of rights as a concept, so you believe there are things that should be protected in the Constitution, for us in the Constitution, because that's our, our scheme of protecting rights, and you start listing off rights on whatever basis, um, you sort of, the question pretty swiftly becomes, what's wrong with socioeconomic rights? Because you know, you list things like, well maybe you'd like free speech, you'd like free religion, um, you'd like some kind of privacy, Pretty soon, if you list off things that are useful for human flourishing, whatever theory of rights you use, you'll come to things like health and food and shelter. So it's kind of natural that if you start from there, you then reach this stage where you're like, well, well what's wrong with those rights that are socioeconomic in nature? So and a lot of the objections to those rights existing flow from claims that they're fundamentally anti-democratic. And it's those objections that I want to focus on. Um, and that's how I want to structure what I'm going to talk about. Um, I want to take them on and show why socioeconomic rights have a role in democracies like our own. They don't, not only do they not undermine democracy, they actually enrich democracy when applied and interpreted by a responsible, independent judiciary. A lot of the objections paint a portrait of this judiciary who, given a chance, will just run entirely wild. Um, and I think it's a kind of implausible, hysterical picture of the judiciary that doesn't really fit in with the, the courts that we have and the courts that would interpret socioeconomic rights. Um, the arguments can be grouped into two heads. So there are those that kind of flow from the nature of democratic rights and those that flow from the role of the courts in democracy. So starting off, first of all, with the arguments that flow from the nature of democratic rights. The first argument um, these kind of say that you know, there's a certain kind of right that you protect in democracy and there's a certain kind of right that you don't. The first would be that socioeconomic rights cost money. Other rights don't. This argument says that what's, what makes socioeconomic right different um, is, the, is the fact that their exercise involves the spending of money and that when the courts get to adjudicate upon them, they get to direct the other branches of the state in how they spend their scarce resources. It says that democratic right is not a right to a material good. And certainly, some rights cost nothing. So free speech, for example, um, is the classic example. It's a negative right, vindicated simply when the state does nothing. And um, or in its classical case, vindicated when the state does nothing. But there are lots of rights that are extremely expensive and yet fiercely protected in a democratic society. And um, classic liberal democratic societies. And the classic example is the rights of the defendant in a criminal trial. Um, now Jerry's adverted to this a little bit already when he said that our courts have a very classical liberal idea of rights. So when you ask them for money for things like barristers um, in a criminal trial, they think that's a fairly square thing to ask for, that's important. Um, but in fact that's a very expensive thing. Um, and the costs of the, the rights of the defendant in a criminal trial are huge. The cost of the entire criminal justice system, judges, barristers, everybody else that's involved. How on earth can you say that that kind of right isn't resource dependent? Um, it definitely is. And people have tried to draw distinctions about this um, and say that, say for example, Mr. Justice Hogan, before he joined the bench, said, argued that socioeconomic rights are inherently resource dependent in a way that other rights aren't. But I think that's a false distinction. There's nothing uh, inherently different, say, between a barrister at work and a builder at work and the resources they provide. They're all things that cost money, um, and they're all things to which one claims a right. So I think that distinction is quite false. 
But even if that distinction did exist, our constitution protects at least one socioeconomic right, so the right to free primary education. So our democratic tradition doesn't set its face against socioeconomic rights, even if liberal democracies did. Um, so I think that, that must be taken into account in a general theory of what a democratic right in our society is. The second argument um, from the nature of democratic rights um, is that socioeconomic rights are inherently political, um, while other rights are not. So it kind of claims that there are certain things that are beyond public discourse. They're uncontestable, um, and that's why they're rights. They're things that people agree on. But socioeconomic rights are opposed by some people, um, and therefore they belong in the political forum and not to the, to the forum of rights. This, is a, this argument, it's sheer blindness is kind of amazing because rights are inherently political because they're almost always contested. And even if the, the right or the name of the right isn't contested, it's very likely that the justification for abridging the right will be contested. You only need to have a written constitution because rights are infringed. Therefore, they're contested, therefore, they're political. Um, take again free speech. A classic, freely, liberal, negative right. Um, it is one of the most political of all rights. Was it, for example, political when the courts had to adjudicate on the ban on Sinn Féin members appearing uh, in broad, the broadcast media? I think that was quite political. Um, other things we trust the courts with include you know, the, de the definition of the word unborn. Fairly political, I would say. Um, property rights. Very strongly protecting the constitution. Pretty political when a court gets a chance to decide the balance between private and public interests uh, in, a, in a piece of legislation calling for proportionality. So again, very charged political questions, I would say. Um, and not that different to a situation where a court has to adjudicate on a socioeconomic right. Um, I would say that rights, just like law itself, are inherently political. And trying to keep them out of your courtroom on that basis uh, is, not, is not a particularly good justification. So there are the arguments that flow from the, um, the nature of democratic rights. The other branch of the democracy arguments are those that flow from um, arguments about the role of the courts in democracy. Um, so these arguments are institutional. They deal not with the core of socioeconomic rights, but with the prospect of the courts enforcing them. Um, so they're, they're kind of more, I suppose, in a sense, procedural uh, in nature. Um, the first argument is that socioeconomic rights give the courts too much power. And this argument can be expressed in a lot of different ways, and I realise that I'm kind of rolling a lot of different arguments into one, but I do think that at its core that these arguments are, are really all the same. So things like you might have heard the claims that socioeconomic rights tie the hands of the executive or the legislature, um, that the courts shouldn't be involved in making policy, um, or that socioeconomic rights offend the separation of powers because they install the courts as the supervisor of the other branches. And you'll notice a lot of that rhetoric comes from Synod and TD and the, the judgments in those cases. Um, so this bunch of critiques are probably you know, one of the most common and most strident criticisms of socioeconomic rights. It kind of conjures this idea of judges as philosopher kings who, if they have these rights, are just going to sit down you know, with a drawing board, pens and paper, maybe crayons, um, and decide how to run the country. Um, but this is, you know, in the place of the democratically elected representatives. I, I think this is wildly inaccurate. If that was how the judiciary responded to enforceable constitutional rights, we would all already be in very serious trouble. Um, it's absolutely not what socioeconomic rights would mean. Um, used responsibly, they simply allow the courts assess whether rights have been adequately vindicated by the other branches of the state. Um, they assess minimum values of rights. They don't allow courts the, the power to create the policies that will vindicate <coughs> those rights. They don't tell the other branches how to vindicate them, just tell them when they've been vindicated. And um, it's perfectly possible for the courts to review executive action and show due deference to the other branches of the state. Um, and actually, I think the Irish experience of socioeconomic rights can, can give a really good example of that. Um, to illustrate that, I want to talk about the decision in 
DB and the Minister for Education. So I don't know if there are any non-law students here, maybe there are. Um, but this, I'll try not to make this that legal. Essentially, Jerry already talked about the cases of TD um, and Senate, in which the Supreme Court rejects socioeconomic rights um, sort of out of hand and potentially forever. Um, this case, DB and the Minister for Education, was the first case where the High Court issued a mandatory order against, um, against a minister, so against the executive. Um, it wasn't appealed. A subsequent case in the same vein was, that was TD. Um, so essentially, this was the first case that crossed the Rubicon and directed, had the courts direct a minister to take a certain action. Um, so it's a very, very important case. I haven't given it an awful lot of attention until I started to teach public interest law. It's very likely that none of you will have thought about it that much either. Because ordinarily, what you do know about it is what the superior courts have said about it, which is largely very, very negative. If you read the case, it's actually quite, quite different. Um, and if you look at the case, it expresses not a kind of heavy-handed, um, you know, arrogant reading of the Constitution, but in fact, quite a considered, responsible, collaborative approach to vindicating the constitutional rights that were at stake. Um, so, just looking to the context of the decision. So there was this whole string of cases that concerned minors that suffered from severe behavioural problems. So typically from very disadvantaged families. Um, they weren't offenders, so they generally weren't in the criminal justice system, but they were often very disturbed. Um, usually a, a great danger to themselves and probably to the people around them. So what they needed was secure care, because in a lot of cases they were violent um, and suicidal. Um, so secure care is quite light detention, but it's not punitive. It's, it's care for the good of the child themselves. Um, so these cases were a series of cases where the applicants, or essentially their representatives, sought secure, secure care orders as a vindication of their constitutional rights. Um, and that's what was at issue here. Now there have been a string of cases in which this had been the claim. Um, since 1995, um, in which there had been declaratory orders saying that there was a constitutional right for children to have these secure care conditions. So the courts had been making secure declaratory orders for secure care since 1995. The judge in question, Mr Justice Kelly, was appointed in 1996, and he dealt with a lot of these cases. Um, and in general, he and other judges adopted a collaborative approach with the department. So, you know, he would hold hearings to see what they were doing. He would say, okay, you know, what stage is this building process at? When is there going to be a secure care facility built? Um, originally, it was supposed to be in 1998. In this case, um, which took place in 1998, I think, um, he was told that secure, the secure uh, facility wasn't going to be completed till 2001. So it was already uh, it's going to be six years after the state had promised to build it. Six years after the state had been told that it was in breach of this of this child of these children's constitutional rights. So it was a very very extreme and very very difficult case. Um, and the background to it is very very important. Um, so in this case, the judge compelled the minister to build those secure units, and um, according to the plan they had put before the court. And if you look at the case, it's very clear that the judge wasn't especially happy to grant that order. And um, he began by saying that mandatory orders shouldn't be made lightly, that they're matters of last resort, and that the constitutional proprieties had to be observed. And in his opinion, they had been. And um, the minister had already had a number of years to try and get this situation together without the courts compelling him to do something. And um, Given that the, the applicants in question were sort of aged 12 to 14, extremely violent and on suicide watch, obviously time was of the essence. So coming to court and saying that it was going to be another three years before the facilities were built wasn't going to be of very much benefit to them. Um, and the court even says that had the minister made any reasonable efforts to vindicate the rights of the applicants, maybe the order wouldn't have to be made. So when you look at the decision, you actually find that the courts were very reluctant to make the order that they did. Um, that they gave the, 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 the minister every opportunity to comply and that he had failed to. There had been years of declaratory orders before this final resort um, was taken. 
So that's really what we can learn from this case, that mandatory orders might be appropriate in as an absolute last resort, after the state has been given time to comply. And, and secondly, that the, state, that the court wasn't tying the minister to a particular policy. The minister built the policy, and had the minister come up with a different policy that also vindicated constitutional rights, that would have been fine too. Um, but that wasn't what was placed before the court. So contrary to the fears of the detractors, socioeconomic rights don't involve the courts making those policies. They involve them reviewing the policies as made by the other branches, and in extreme circumstances, compelling them to take the actions that the constitution mandates. Um, so finally, and very briefly, I just want to deal with one final um, argument from democracy about socioeconomic rights. Um, and this is one that is very pithy, and it comes up in a lot of the cases, which says that if you want a socioeconomic right, you should take your claim to Leinster House, not to the Four Courts. Um, I think it sounds great, and it's kind of intuitively exciting, because you like the idea that people should you know, involve themselves in politics, join labour or whatever, and you know, make your claim in the public forum. Um, but it's, it's quite flimsy, because all it says is that if your argument is good enough, then the majority will like it. So if, you're, if your right is a real right, then it will already be protected because you'll have made your argument in the public forum and convinced people, um, because the majority will get it right. That's absolutely not what our democratic settlement is about at all. We have a written constitution. Um, with judicial review on the grounds of fundamental rights. The very purpose of rights are to constrain the majority, to get in the way of, of, pub, of the, pub, the political whim and you know, the yay or nay of like, common ignorance. The purpose of them is actually to be counter-majoritarian, um, to stop the majority doing what they want. So simply saying, well, if you were so clever with your socioeconomic rights, you could take that argument down to the forefront or your dad's lens or house and win, is absolutely not what we mean when we talk about um, having any kind of fundamental rights in, a, in our society. Um, it's widely accepted that a primary purpose of constitutionalism is to protect minorities, in particular discrete and insular minorities. Um, and often those discrete and marginalised uh, majorities are extremely disorganised as well. Um, and I think that DBA, the Minister for Education, again, provides the perfect illustration of that point. Um, so the response of the, the Supreme Court essentially to, to the claimant was, well, you know, secure care is so important, this should be dealt with in the political forum. And how exactly are the applicants in cases like DB and TD supposed to organise politically? We're talking about 12 to 14 year olds who are severely disturbed, huge danger to themselves and lots of other people, are they supposed to get together with their friends and join the political forum to make their case there? Absolutely not. They're precisely the kind of vulnerable minority that can't use the political process, and precisely the kind of vulnerable minority that need the help of rights, which in most cases are socioeconomic. Um, other minorities you might lump with them are people like travellers, prisoners, people who are very unlikely to be able to use the political process to their advantage. Um, so, just to sum up, um, I think it's really important to note that in debates about socioeconomic rights, and maybe, you know, rights in general, people love to say they have democracy on their side. They try and play it like, you know, this Trump card. Um, but often, the view of democracy is, is flawed, it's based on, you know, a flawed account of, de of democratic rights, or an exaggeration of the bad things that could happen in a democracy if courts are given the opportunity to protect rights very, very stridently. And I think cases like DB just show that a restrained, collaborative, uh, responsible approach could actually mean that the socioeconomic rights have a very valuable play role to play in democracy. Thank you. Thanks very much for both your genuinely thought-provoking and interesting speeches. Um, I think you're right, Andrea, you probably are preaching to the choir, but at least you've both given us arguments and justifications to go out and argue with our own friends about vindication of socioeconomic rights. So I'm sure there are plenty of questions after those speeches, so we'll have time for a few. Gary? Yeah, I have a question.
like, say, a true shelter or a true food or a true education. Do you believe that could justify social economic rights as well? Well, I, I think that the liberal democratic tradition in its primary impulse is, is a, a concern about an oppressive state and it sees rights in that sort of context. Now, um, you know, there are, you know, I, I would see that, you know, going back to what Hollenbach said earlier to the record, you know, that, that liberalism does see rights in, in that sort of negative sense, that, that you need rights to protect you against the state. Um, clearly that view isn't shared by, by everybody. I mean, I, I, I would subscribe to the view of rights in appropriate circumstances as being positive empowerments, but I'm coming from a different philosophical tradition uh, in the social democratic tradition, again, I think, uh, and, and in other communitarian, um, other communitarian perspectives, the people would defend rights uh, as being necessary for participation in society. I, I, I don't know to what extent, maybe I have a, a sort of simplistic view of liberalism, but I don't know to what extent you can stretch the liberal model to, to embrace that sort of um, positive participatory right. I think it moves you into a, onto a different part of the ideological landscape, if you want to argue for, for rights as participatory rights. Any others? Any? Okay. Uh, just, uh, I wanted to know what do you think about the, the quotation of in uh, Esprit des Lois, the spirit of Louis Montesquieu, when he said that um, between the, the strong and the weak, I would say, uh, the freedom oppressed and the low, uh, Low protect, actually, the low, it's a, a mean of freedom. So why do you think about this quotation? Because at Britain, for instance, Montesquieu was a very well-known author about the separation of power. Um, so it could be also a good argument, I think, to uh, push for this kind of right and social and economic rights. So what do you think about that? Yes. So, so could that also, given that Montesquieu is the originator of, so, of the separation of powers? Yeah, so I think uh, Montesquieu could be used uh, also in a very uh, liberal democratic background, but I think it could be also used, uh, for instance, for a more social approach mm -hmm. on rights, because he also said in this book, for instance, that it's a statement that the, uh, the freedom between uh, the strong and the weak, freedom oppressed, and uh, actually it's the law that protects. So in a way, it's a uh, it it's uh, confirmed, and it's um, uh, yeah, it's confirmed that the state, in a way, and uh, the, the court also have to act mm -hmm. to protect in this situation, this free art situation. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, I, 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 um, I think one of the disappointing consequences of the Irish jurisprudence in, in TV and Synod is precisely that the checks and balances that the doctrine of separation of powers advocates is missing when we come to uh, the protection of socio-economic socio rights. Because the Supreme Court in those two cases essentially said, we're backing off on this. This is going to be a wholly political uh, matter. It's entirely for the legislature and the executive to decide what socio-economic rights people are going to have, if any, and to what extent they're going to be protected. And, and I agree with you, you know, that, that I, I think that's problematic because I think the courts could have played an important role checking, you know, acting as that balance to the, the political impulse of the legislature and the executive. And it's interesting to compare, you know, what did happen prior to the decisions in TV and Senate. It seems to me that the, the, the courts, in monitoring, particularly in relation to the, the rights of children and, and the rights of children to um, the rights of children with, with learning difficulties to have appropriate education and the rights of children um, uh, in need of secure accommodation. It seemed to me that the judicial decisions there did have some impact on the political process. It did require the, the, the politicians to pay attention to a group of people who hitherto had been ignored. Um, for example, um, when Mary Hannafin was being appointed as Minister for State for Children uh, back in the or early noughties, maybe early noughties. Uh, I remember her saying in an interview that uh, she was instructed by the then Bishop Bertie Ahern that her task was to address the problems that were going to the courts, the cases that were coming before the likes of Peter Kelly, these children in need of secure accommodation. And so the courts there were playing this useful 
role of, of operating as sort of a check or a monitor of what was happening or more accurately what wasn't happening. And I agree with you that since the Supreme Court has applied the brakes there, you know, the doctrine of separation of powers isn't working properly in that area because you've got the legislature and the executive, and, and we know that they're both very closely aligned, the legislature essentially being dominated by the executive. They are the only people uh, calling the shots in this area. I think that's really um, regretted, you know. Maybe just to follow up on that, exactly like the, when I mentioned the word supervisor, that's from, I think, from TD, you know, this idea that they're, they're terrified of the court speaking as a supervisor of the other branches. But that, to some extent, is to shirk the burden placed on the courts by our constitutional system, which is the courts as a vindicator of rights. It's not that they're above the rest of the branches, it's just that they are the ones that interpret the rights. They have this some quasi-supervisory role. Um, and I think, it, you know, to sort of to shirk that is, is to rely on the separation of powers in a way that is an untrue interpretation of what it was supposed to be. Are there any more questions? Yeah, back. Yeah, I just want to add. You know, the way you mentioned that the cost, the socioeconomic growth is quite different. It's very, um, it costs a lot of money. You know, it's capital intensive. And then if, and you mentioned uh, what I would call a, an apposite case, you know, the, the TD case, case and the DP case, they're quite, and Sino, they're quite a very important case in that, in that they're seeking to um, um, get their, their right to secure protection. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when it comes to um, right to housing, you know, in the sense that uh, the homeless, for, for instance, and if they start claiming that they have right to house and then go to court to seeking to enforce their right. You know, uh, won't we wonder when the court will draw the line, you know, you know where uh, they can say, uh, actually, this is not within our premise. This is for this is not for the uh, legislature, you know, taking into account the separation of all, like the last speaker's court. So, you know, uh, that's quite an uh, area of concern to me. I, I would respond to that by saying that, that um, it seems that in, in theory there are two responses the courts could use when asked to protect socioeconomic rights. Um, the more radical approach and, and the one that would, would um, perhaps involve the courts in, in, in uh, having a more intrusive role vis-a-vis uh, -vis the legislature and the executive would be where the courts would be called upon to determine the minimum content of any socioeconomic right. Uh, and so, for example, in relation to uh, accommodation for, for homeless people, that the courts would come along and say, right, Ireland must provide this level of accommodation for uh, the homeless population, okay? Uh, and stipulate certain minimum standards. Now, that's one theoretical approach the courts could take, and as I say, it's more intrusive. There is a less intrusive approach that the courts could take, which would still offer some protection for social and economic rights, and it might address your concerns. And that is where the courts test what the other branches of government have done against a standard of reasonableness. Um, in other words, the courts don't come along and say, right, we're absolutely insisting that you must have a minimum standard of health care or accommodation or education. They don't do that. What they say is, Given all the circumstances, and of course the, the elephant in the room here is given the state of public finances, given the monies that are available to the state, is the provision that has been made in this area, is it reasonable or not? Um, and, you know, I would certainly be content if, if, if the courts even had that more moderate role. I mean, if you look at the, the um, history behind the education children with severe and profound learning difficulties. In, in that situation, we had, up until the mid-1990s, a situation in which no provision was made for children with severe and profound learning difficulties. I mean, the state regarded them as incapable of being educated. So no provision was made at all, uh, or very, sorry, I shouldn't say at all, but extremely little provision was made for, for the education of these particular children. And eventually, under the, the, the pressure of two high court decisions, of which Sinead was the second, or Sinead would be the first, uh, the state started to address 
and the, 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 the education needs of these children, and actually put in place, I think, fairly useful resources. And there was a significant increase in the amount of expenditure on, say, the employment of special needs assistance for uh, autistic children in, in schools, uh, examples like that. Now, having done that, and then the, the Supreme Court having pronounced from high that the courts were never to get involved in enforcing implied socioeconomic rights, the courts subsequently, the high court cases subsequently in this area, uh, you found the courts operating with this reasonableness standard. Uh, they, they, they more or less said, well, this is what the state has done in vindicating this right to education. Uh, is, it, is it reasonable? And, and looking at what the state has done, they concluded, yes, what is offered here is reasonable. And uh, that, as I say, is, is a more moderate position. It allows for the courts to have some oversight of, of the other branches of government, but at the same time, it requires the courts to take into account the realities of public uh, finances and particularly if Well, well, clearly, if, if a proposal was put to the people um, to recognise justiciable socio-economic rights in the Constitution, or, or I should say more accurately, to add to the existing justiciable socio-economic rights which are in the Constitution, and there it referred to the right to education, the right to primary education, that's already there. You could argue that the, the duty on the state to supply the place of parents and looking after children who, who uh, are not being looked after their, by their parents, that's another uh, existing justiciable socioeconomic rights in the Constitution. But anyway, so they're already there. If, if there was a referendum to add to that list of justiciable socioeconomic rights, the courts clearly would be under a constitutional duty. The judges have to uphold the Constitution to enforce those rights. So the critical question then will become, how do you frame the, the, the what, what wording do you use in protecting these rights? And it goes back to that uh, two those two theoretical uh, approaches that I mentioned a moment ago. Do you frame the, word, the, the rights in such a way that you're talking about the courts having to identify the minimum content, or do you back off that bit and, and allow the courts to use a sort of a reasonable standard? I think that's where the debate would take place or could take place around uh, a wording there. Well, obviously, you'd have to be very careful in how you did word it, because you would want to try and overcome the sort of conservative stance of the courts on it as well. Um, but I think you're kind of also touching on a really important part of the debate, which is some people object to socioeconomic rights because they see them as something that could ever be only ever be inserted by judges, so that they, by their nature, would be kind of a product of judicial activism. Whereas what you're suggesting is the constitutional convention inserting them, you know, or sorry, the people inserting them via the constitutional con convention. That's a very different proposition. So that would be like, in, in a, you know, that would be that would be a higher level of democratic legitimacy, right? Because it would be that everyone would have sat down and said, okay, well, we have decided that we do believe in certain enforceable socioeconomic rights. I, I noticed that the, the Constitutional Convention, when we had our last meeting, I think, when they were dealing with the position of carers and they were calling for um, the, the removal of the sort of sexist language that currently exists in the Constitution around the role of women in the home. But what they were looking for was um, you know, replacement of that language with a broader affirmation of, of the state's duty to carers. Um, and it seemed to me they were open to the idea that this new wording might impose some obligation on the state uh, positively to support carers. And it seemed to me they were open to the idea that the Constitution should protect the socioeconomic rights of, of carers. You know? Any more questions? Just as you mentioned that, you know, the new, the, the new Article 42, the 
fact that uh, there's a law of relation of states to uh, look after the kids if they are, if they are parents hurt them in a failure to provide for their welfare and the uh, safety. And the, um, I think uh, John Walter, you know, the, the, the debate he had with Minister Shatter, you know, I think he raised the issue of uh, um, some of the parents, you know, being quite pecunious that they can't afford the um, housing or adequate accommodation. And they might as well see their child being removed from them. And do you think, do you think there's a dimension to argue that the, the state can, you know, uh, follow the Austin, Austin case, which, which um, obliged them to, to take the last, uh, the, the, the lesser, um, approach in order to indicate the child that would be less drastic uh, before actually removing the child from the program. And in that perspective, do you think that somebody can argue that um, they have to um, support the, the, the family and uh, provide for, for welfare uh, for them? Yeah. And that, that, that might open up for to take on this argument. Yeah. I mean, the, the new wording of the Act of Forced Degree on Children does call for a proportionate state response, you know, to protect children. So, you know, um, that, that might have been implicitly there in the existing uh, text, but it's, it's certainly explicitly there in the, in the new text. Uh, and so I imagine that would prevent a situation arising in which the state could come in and take children out of the family because of some relatively minor dereliction of duty on the part of the parents. Um, one technical concern I have about the new wording, though, is that uh, the existing wording, Article 42.5, which incidentally is still in place, because even though um, the referendum took place, there's been a challenge to the referendum, and so on, so that challenge is sorted out, we, we still operate with Article 42.5. Article 42.5 is, for we lawyers say, is self-executing. It's not dependent on the Oireachtas enacting legislation in order to implement it. Whereas, when you look at the wording of the new provision, the equivalent clause, and I can't remember what the wording is, the numbering is, but the equivalent clause in the new, te in the new text will require the Oireachtas to enact legislation. And that's a bit of a concern, because if the Oireachtas doesn't enact the appropriate legislation, then where are we at? Um, you know, so in terms of vindicating the socioeconomic rights of children on the street for, you know, where the parents are off the scene. If there isn't appropriate legislation, does that mean that, that, that these children are now less well protected than they were under, under the old uh, clause? Now there is of course obviously the Child Care Acts. Um, that legislation is in place and hopefully that legislation will be fit for the purpose. But as a lawyer you'd always be a bit concerned if there was some sort of unintentional gap in that legislation that nobody had anticipated, um, then you could run into uh, difficulties in this area. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, look, if there's no other questions, we'll uh, end it here. Thanks very much for everyone for coming, and thanks for all your questions, and please join me in thanking both our speakers. <laughs>